Hello, everybody. I'm Nate with uh, Stained Glass Stories here with The Synth Snail. And today we'll be interviewing Hobie Eklund, uh, bassist from Majesty Crush, journalist, and uh, yeah, uh, just overall uh, great guy. Thank you. That's very kind. Yeah, yeah. Great to have you here. So yeah, I think we could just start off by talking about some of your guys' influences as a band. Um, I know being from Detroit, there's a heavy Motown influence. And so I would just kind of like to hear about that. Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing I ever remember was hearing, uh, I think it was the Four Tops or the Temptations, I'll be there. And I just love that melody, that dun, dun, dun. And that would be something I would hear later in like Joy Division and New Order and with the really melodic, but kind of sullen bass lines and stuff. Um, I know Odell and Dave literally grew up in Southfield with the nieces and nephews of Motown royalty. And um, Dave actually knew T-Boy Ross, who was Diana Ross's um, brother. And he co-wrote the song, I Want You for Marvin Gaye. So okay. you absolutely cannot rule out just growing up with like Motown radio in Detroit is one of these places. It's one of the biggest radio markets in the world because of the strong presence of the auto industry. So you had um, a lot of like indie radio, like there was a station called WDT. There was a station in Canada that would uh, Brent Banbury would play. It was called Brave New Waves. It would play like all the import stuff out of England and stuff. Um you had um, MTV had 120 minutes at that time. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's where there was actually a guy from England playing stuff like Cocteau Twins videos and Jesus and Mary Chain videos. And we would literally go over to Odell's house in his, you know, in his, in his bedroom and watch VHS tapes that he recorded of that. Um, I would also say one of the, one of the great, obviously the, the greatest thing was we had Michael Siegel, who wound up becoming our guitar player years before he played guitar for us. He worked at the cool record store in Detroit. It was called played again records. And the owner was Alan Covan. And Alan was like, he was like friends with simple minds, right? He's like, those are his buddies. So he was always going to England and they had a huge import presence, just massive. And the irony is, you know, we're all into, um, I mean, it's kind of a weird story, but my girlfriend in college, one of her best friends was kind of girlfriend to Perry Farrell. Now, pre-James Addiction, he had a band called Psycom, which was sort of gothy. But we kind of knew of James Addiction before it was James Addiction. We just knew it as, oh, it was, you know, um, it was... It was a friend of a friend's band from L.A. So oh, wow. it, so we didn't know about them as this band with a lot of hype. We just knew it about it as like, oh, it's so-and-so's, you know, boyfriend's band. And the things that I think we gravitated around were things that were, for lack of a better word, they had this kind of what Odell would call covert. They were very unorthodox they were noisy like Jesus and Mary Chain, or they were unusually beautiful like Cocteau Twins. Um, but they also had at their heart like a pop sensibility and melody and something in it that would make you listen to it and resonate with it the same way you would resonate with the things we grew up listening to on the radio, whether it was Motown or, you know, FM radio when it was playing like David Bowie and like you know boston um and even the urban radio stations in detroit cannot be underestimated there was a guy named the electrifying mojo he was the midnight dj on the biggest urban station in detroit and you know what i mean when i say urban station and he would come on every night you can find these videos on youtube he would do this whole thing that it was like he was landing a spaceship and you were part of this world and he would take you on a journey and he would play like craft work. He would play oh, the B-52s. Yeah. 
like when the Beastie Twos toured in Detroit for the first time, like in the early 80s, they went and did an interview with him. He broke Rock Lobster in Detroit. The story always goes Rock Lobster stopped a lot of violence in the 80s at the height of crack because <laughs> people after the clubs would spill out, they'd be drunk. These gang kids would start to get in each other's faces at a at a gas station. And then the radio Rock Lobster would come on and it was so goofy and fun, nobody would want to shoot each other. And this is quantifiable. <laughs> you can like Google this stuff. So we grew up with an impossibly good background of music that just kept gently moving forward. Like, for instance, I was the arts editor of the Michigan Daily. I went to the University of Michigan. And that's actually how I discovered Spawn Ranch, the band that I wound up joining, that Odell was the drummer in. And I was just a super fan of the band and joined. And we would just, you know, we'd trade music. We were really into, like, Sonic Youth. We were really into... um you know, Jesus and Mary Chain was always a rallying point because they were so cool, <laughs> you know, yeah. and they were so noisy, but they, in their heart, see, I think a lot of other people got into the Ramones. To me, the Jesus and Mary Chain were sort of like the more Euro cool version of the Ramones. I Instantly identifiable, kind of extreme, but with a deep, deep pop heart and a deep respect for pop music. And those were kind of like the things that influenced us. I would also say the thing that influenced Majesty Crush specifically was the sense that we can do this, that we can write songs. Like Jane's Addiction put out this EP. It's, a, it's all acoustic versions. This is before MTV Unplugged. And this is that Jane's Addiction, like mountain-sized Jane's Addiction, crazy, you know, big rock sounding. But no, 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 no. Their first EP was on a label called Triple X, and it's just them playing unplugged. And so it's all kind of drifting along, and they do a version of Lou Reed's. It's actually the Velvet Underground um, rock and roll, and it was all right. And they do Jane Says, and they do these songs. And the thing you notice about them is there's the bass line. The guitar line is kind of more abstract, but there it is. There's the drums, there's the vocal, and I don't need anything else. It was like those four elements were so complete and so cohesive. And we actually listened to a ton of hip hop, you know? I mean, we would go see Public Enemy play, you know? We were all into, during the Spawn Ranch era, um, Dave actually lived with me. We were very into like NWA. We just thought, the extremes that we were hearing in early hip hop, both sonically and thematically, to me, that was the next extension of post-punk and punk rock. You know, it's why Sonic Youth had Chuck D from Public Enemy on a song. I think it was very logical to turn to hip hop because it was so exciting and it had so much dimension. And it also taught you how to write a song. You know, I always say this and the guys always gave me crap for it, but EPMD... <laughs> They're, they're kind of the East Coast band with the West Coast chill. They had a song called So What You Saying. And it was this really simple loop that would just keep returning, repeating and repeating. And then it has this part that goes off into a totally different loop. And then it comes back. And that was how I wrote my parts for the song Sunny Pie, which was the first song we did as a seven inch. Because listening to hip hop was like, you just have to have a part. And then a break and you have a song, you know, it wasn't about, well, what key is this in? What's this? What's this? And that was, I would say, one of the biggest influences for me was that this could get done. What I cannot underestimate is Detroit was also home to a group called His Name is Alive. And to be that close, like it wasn't us, but there was a band from Detroit that was signed to 4AD Records. Oh, wow. And I think I've told you this. It's like. You know, and the greatest thing about that was the story goes when Warren DeFever from it, he's my optometrist cousin, by the way, which is hilarious. And my little sister was best friends with one of his nieces. It's crazy. I know. Right. So with that interconnected. Yeah. But he goes and visits Ivo Watts Russell and C Catherine, like Catherine, like um, what do you call it? Elizabeth Frazier and all that stuff. 
And when oh, he's yeah. hanging out with the Cocteau twins, they're playing Iggy and the Stooges records. And he thinks they're trying to ingratiate him by playing Detroit records. <laughs> and they explain, no, this is what we think we sound like. Repetitious, kind of a drone, and the vocals pop on top of it. But we're these like people from England, <laughs> you know, yeah. So we can't pull off the Stooges. So we're going to do something that's the similar with the repetition in the loop feeling. We're just going to do it with this bright, shiny tone as a part to this dark, dingy tone. And that blew my mind because it really made sense. Like the Stooges, you know, I mean, one of the funnest things about starting a band is when you first realize you can play another band's song and then you can see, hey, that's how it's done. That's a finished song. And then you can go write your own song and go, that's done. That's like, it's like a miracle. These things even make their way, you know, to a jam box tape in the rehearsal studio, let alone um, being able to get a record pressed and even having it exist in the world. It's, it's like a miracle. You can even get this interview done. You know, there's just so many factors that go into it. And the biggest influence was Michael working at this record store. And this, I'm going to go back to this. So Dave is living with me. We're in Spawn Ranch. And Michael, who we had no idea would ever play with us or whatever, is the cool record store clerk. And he sells Dave a record by a group called A.R. Kane called 69. Oh, and he brings it back and puts it on. And we're like, this is amazing. This is like dub reggae, Jesus and Mary Chain. It's swooning. It's beautiful. It's got a little... I don't want to say silliness into it, but it was like, everything goes crazy. It was like, this was amazing. Wait a minute. This is by black dudes. You're kidding me. And right away we were like, we can do this. And what's funny is we discovered that record collectively four years, three years before the band even started. We discovered it in 19, about two years, maybe in 1987, 88. Or whenever wow. it came out, I think it came out in 89. I want to say it came out in 89, 88, 89. Whenever it came out, we had had that record and just lived with it for like a year. And then once Spawn Ranch had broken up and we all kind of refigured and we decided to form Majesty Crush, that was like the tape we were just listening to over and over and over again. And then Michael would make us these tapes. It played again records of all these great import things. And I think I've shared this with you, but the, the thing that blew our minds was the Verve did an extremely limited edition live EP called Voyager One. It's on YouTube. I think it Discog, <laughs> Discogs has it for like, it's really expensive. Yeah. But it has live versions of like Slide Away from a Storm in Heaven. And it's much more, I don't want to say simple, but it's much more rock, not in a bad way, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit more straightforward than the version that makes its way onto the uh, Storm in Heaven album. And that just, that gave us something to really aspire to because what they were capable of live with these very simple ingredients, very prominent bass line, very figurative guitar line, very steady, great drums, but a singer who was in front of it all, really just going nuts. And we were like, this is this is kind of what intuitively I think we want to do. We have a we have a front man who's not trying to play guitar. He's not moaning. He's out in front. He's stalking the stage. He's walking around. And I think the things that influenced us were things that we felt like, hey, we could do this, but we also love this. You know, I always say one of the things that turned me on the most was um, um, there's a loop live record called Prisma Uber Europa. There's three versions of it on Spotify. It's the one that starts with the bass line, but it's basically a two note jam that goes on for 15 minutes. And the bass line is when you hear it, you'll hear it's exactly the kind of bass lines I love the big, deep, melodic, cure kind of deal, Joy Division thing. Yeah, yeah. And you know, in Detroit, everything's 15 minutes from each other. So you'd put in that cassette to drive to practice. You'd put in that cassette to drive to a show. You'd put in that cassette to drive to a club. And I would just listen to this over and over again.
And again, the th- two qualities of it were, A, it was great, and B, we can do this. So I guess the thing that's really important to get as far as influences, the things that influenced us were things that we felt like we were capable of. Like we can do something like this, but do it ourselves. We can do our own thing. A lot of bands in Detroit at this time were kind of following the grunge lead or the more straightforward rock lead, you know? And we couldn't identify with that. We weren't good enough musicians. I didn't know what a key was. I didn't know what a scale was. Michael played a guitar with three strings, but we knew what we were doing. We could find, make something cohesive. And that's what gave us all the life in the world was we can do this. We can get this done. And that's why we did the Sonny Pai Cicciolina single because we could, you know? Yeah. That was huge. Yeah, no, it's interesting too. You mentioned the Verve because, you know, when I listen to like Horse or uh, Feign Sleep, you can kind of hear that, uh, it almost reminds you of Gravity Grave, you know? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Line, you know, so yeah, I can yeah. hear definitely the influence with that. Yeah. And the thing that was so wild was we didn't, I didn't know the Verb that well. I, I I mean, this is what I know about the Verb. They toured with the Black Crows in England. Did they really? It's so, so we different. think of them as being a cool little indie underground band. In England, they were Pink Floyd. Yeah. They were up there with the Black Crows. And now that I mention it, you can probably totally see it. They were like a great, crazy, psychedelic band. You know, I'd also throw in as an influence the Stone Roses. Oh, yeah. Because the Stone Roses were capable of writing songs like Waterfall. You know, Mm -hmm. they could write things with really deep bass grooves like, um, you know, I Want to Be Adored, which is, you know, one of the greatest songs of all time. But you think about it, they're like these ruffians from Manchester and they're writing Waterfall, which is one of the most beautiful songs ever written. And that was something too. Like they weren't afraid to be pretty. They weren't afraid to be soft. They just wanted to be good. They were very secure. That's something we definitely embraced. I mean, there was something subversive about writing songs like Penny for Love or Uma, which are very poppy. They're very straightforward. They're not these moody poet things like Fane Sleeper Horse, but they were something that gave like Dave something to jump out in front of. And it proved that we could write a tight little single, you know? I mean, Pennies for Love is based on Smells Like Teen teen Spirit. It's very, very similar as far as the simplicity and the way it's arranged. It's much simpler. It's like a, you know, it's like a UK indie pop version of it. But that's what I was thinking when I wrote the bass line. How simple can this be? It's going to have three notes. <laughs> and yeah. one of the notes is going to do double duty. You know, it's D, 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 A. And then it's A, 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 B. That's the entire song. That's it. That's it. That's all you need. Yeah, and the ability. Kind of... to, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, greater than the sum or the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, you know. Uh, and I got to say with uh, Penny's Penny for Love in particular, I was surprised uh, hearing the backstory behind that song, too. You know, because the, <laughs> the first time I hear that song, my first impression of hearing that song is like, oh, it's a bright, sort of hopeful song, you know, saving yeah. up money one day, running off with your love, going off, seeing the world. That's how I first saw it. But then to hear the backstory behind it, it's, it's quite. Yeah, well, also like what's in, in the backstory is that Dave, Dave was always the prime mover. He got this townhouse in an area of Detroit called Indian Village, which is on the east side of Detroit, close to the main east and west artery called Jefferson. And it's an area that's kind of old school. It has these really big old houses, but it's surrounded by sort of rougher neighborhoods. We had a townhouse, so we were in a better part of it, but it was also a neighborhood that was surrounded by crime. Mm -hmm. And we never got the whole story, but something happened where Dave was somehow picked up under suspicion of being a robber because a lady had gotten robbed coming out of her car with her groceries. And the only description was a light-skinned black guy with a gap in his front teeth. Why Dave went to jail for this, I don't know. But the story goes, he was basically in all weekend. It finally, he got out on Monday. And the practice we had that night, we wrote pennies for love. And it was always kind of a joke. Like you would expect we, you know, cover NWA, F the police or something. But he wound up writing something that was very upbeat and very whatever. But also 
you got to give Dave credit. It's a story about being a male prostitute to save up enough money to run off with your love and save her from prostitution. So it's got this like, Dave is capable of tapping into this like prince. And I guess today, like the way the weekend does these kind of like erotic role play kind of crazy things, but he makes it sound so fun, even though it's a little perverse. And that was like, to me, one of the greatest examples of that. It's the simplest, prettiest pop song we have. And it's, you know, sometimes I'm selling my body for less than a penny too. It's not always for honey, but honey tastes so good. You know, that's the way Dave thought. And his his writing was incredible. And I'm going to just say this flat out. There was no vocalist. And I'll even, you know, throw in groups like the Verb and Oasis. No one was writing stuff at this level of like being in your own little like psychoerotic world and creating this world where things kind of made sense, but they were, it was almost like a dream, you know? One of the funniest things is um, the song Boyfriend. It's been on Spotify for like, what, a year now or whatever. And the lyrics blank out at one point because there's a point in it where Dave goes, I'll bring you minestrone. He'll bring you minestrone when you want egg drop. He's talking about soup. He's talking about he's going to be a better boyfriend to this girl because the guy will bring her soup she doesn't want, but he'll bring her, he'll bring her the egg egg drop that she wants. And that's just crazy funny, but it's also crazy good. And that's the kind of stuff Dave was capable of. And I think that's something that there's one thing I can own. I'm whenever I'm in a band, I'm like a mascot, right? I always think of the bass. It's kind of like the big fun dog that's running along, smiling up at you, waiting for you to throw the ball. But the base is kind of like, it's a prime ingredient, but it's not the spice. Dave was the spice. Michael was the spice. Odell was the spice. They took these very conventional pop ideas I had, and they made them moodier. They made them deeper. They made them more resonant. They took them from being, you know, Uma could sound like a, a 60s single and it turned it into something that was a little bigger, a little better. Um, And I give those guys utter and total credit. They were a thousand times cooler than me. I'm kind of like this preppy nerd who grew up up in a a suburb of Detroit called Gross Point. And the irony was Susie Quattro, who's like a rock woman. She was on Happy Days. She played Fonzie's love interest. I know you're going to have to Google all this stuff. It's way before your time. She went to my high school the band Negative Approach went to my high school. Um, there was a group called Figures on a Beach that was signed to Sire Records. That was like a new wave band. They were from Gross Point. So I grew up kind of in a really nice, privileged background, but also with a lot of deep dysfunction in it. And that's what drew me to music. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the things, the first concerts I ever saw was, you know, when I, in my kind of like new wave punk rock phase was Psychedelic Furs. I wound up seeing them something like seven times in maybe three or four years. I'd see them every time. And they were dark, they were moody, but they were approachable. You know, they were a group that made great songs with great elements, but you could tell it was like a murky, dark kind of thing. And it always kind of reminded me a little bit about the Velvet Underground. And again, the Velvet Underground were one of those bands that could write really simple songs that were really good. Chichiolina is a riff on All Tomorrow's Parties by the Velvet Underground, which is like this big boom, 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 boom. And that's what Chichiolina started off as, almost like as a cover. So oh, again, really? you know, the influence of now, now you'll hear it. You'll never not hear it. But, you know, we were just surrounded by so much. Um, I don't even know how to put it. It's, 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 you know, the thing I realized even just talking about it now is one of the things that influenced us was the fact that this music existed and it was finding an audience. I think that influenced us as much as the actual sound of it. The idea that we could get a hold of an obscure 12 inch from England and be listening to it, you know, like the Verve Voyager one, it, it, it felt like you were somehow tapping into some kind of secret, you know, frequency somewhere. But that frequency was alive, you know, and that's what was so incredible about it was 
being able to feel like we were existing in the same world as these bands. And I think that's the chiefest, that's the biggest thing I can say as far as our influences. They, they were bands that were accomplished, but they weren't so, it wasn't like King Crimson or something where you would just marvel at it. These were bands we could see, we could see the recipes, we could see the formulas, and we could also see how good it was, you know, like the Stone Roses, you know, Stone Roses, yeah. big bass lines. Funky drumming, dedicated front man, and a guitar player who wasn't afraid to make a lot of different kinds of sounds. There you go. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Um, you know, I remember you saying with uh, with your interview with uh, Henry Boyer, I think it was something like, I don't want to misquote you, but it was like Odell played the drums melodically. You're playing the bass like a guitar. Uh, Mike's playing the guitar kind of in a kind of hazy way. He's not riffing, you know? And then you have mm-hmm. Dave up on stage, all charismatic with these strange themes that um, yeah. typically you wouldn't hear um, um, with that kind of music. So I just think that's interesting. But that, that's what's nuts. And this is the other thing. This is the funny, weird thing. So Spawn Ranch, the band that we were in before, was kind of like Jane's Addiction. Our singer was very like a choir boy. Odell played on his knees, super like tribal drumming. The guitar player used a lot of weird tunings and I just kind of kept up the pace. And Motor Booty Magazine called us black leather jackets for, uh, or called us new age music for people with black leather jackets. Motor Booty was a, a really great like fanzine magazine that came out of Ann Arbor in the late 80s, early 90s and had a lot of really prominent writers like Mike Rubin who was actually a roommate of Bradley from Spawn Ranch. He and I lived together in college and we had a roommate in this guy who wrote for this. And um, what was so incredible was Spawn Ranch was playing with a lot of bands that were way darker and way harder than us. We would play with, we opened for My Buddy Valentine on There Isn't Anything tour. We played with um, Psychic TV a bunch. We played with The Swans. These are bands, I don't know if you know them, but they are brutal. (laughs) They are scary. And we were up there, this cute little band doing this, you know, kind of dark, but very, a singer was great. Rob, Bob Sterner, God rest his soul. He passed away, but he had like a choir church background. So we kind of inherited that when we started Majesty Crush. I learned how to play bass from the bass player in the group called the Laughing Hyenas, Kevin Monroe. We'd gone to high school together. We had mutual friends. His dad was the first chair flautist for the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, and they had a big house in Indian Village, where in high school, I picked up the bass for the first time. And I learned how to play bass from the Laughing Hyenas records, because the Laughing Hyenas, all you need to know is the bass lines are very kind of driving, and they have very set amount of notes, and they form a complete circuit. And the guitar player, Larissa, um, God rest her soul, she, she's passed away. Rolling Stone recognized her as one of the top 200 guitarists of all time. But she was playing very figuratively. You are getting, you can start to hear the formula. And the drums were kind of tribal. And there was a crazy front man in front of it in John Brandon, who is now the singer of negative. He was and still is the singer of negative approach. So back in the day, <laughs> we would play with groups like the Laughing Hyenas, that if you go listen to Laughing Hyenas right now, you're like, what are you talking about? This stuff is like, it's terrifying. It's loud, it's screaming. But again, you take away the one layer, we were kind of like the fun band that all the hard bands liked. There was a really funny story when Lenny Kravitz came out that all the Sunset Strip metal bands like Guns N' Roses and everybody, they loved Lenny Kravitz. Because Lenny Kravitz was the was the more romantic, sexy record you'd put on when you were like romancing yeah. before you went back out to being hair metal guy. And so <laughs> Madison Crush was kind of adopted by these really heavy bands like Wig. Wig was actually called Birthday Party Meets Public Enemy. And it's funny, but like when Majesty Crush started, one of the guys, two of the guys quit laughing hyenas one of the guys quit wig and they formed a group called mule in the same basement in the same townhouse in indian village at exactly the same time 
as Majesty Crush. And we had nothing to do with each other as far as the sounds. We couldn't have been more different. But if you peel back that, okay, one's more noisy and chaotic, one is more rhythmic and swirly and shoegazy, you can kind of see this kindred spirit shift. And that's one of the deep ironies of Majesty Crush is we played with anybody and everybody, but we were often described as like this feminine band that would somehow complement whomever we were playing with. You gotta remember our very first show was Mazzy Star in 1991. It was on my birthday, August 16th. And that was huge because we had like maybe five songs. We're nervous as hell. And Mazzy Star, of course, it's everybody waiting an hour to hear fade into you. And you know, it was like we were the perfect band to be on that because we weren't too loud. We weren't too rock. We weren't too whatever because we were this simple little band. And I think that's how we got a lot of opportunities because we were able to reach audiences through playing with bands that were more complex than we were. But we somehow, I think audiences sympathized with us because we were maybe more direct and we were more approachable and digestible. And I think that's where we got a lot of fans from was because we existed in kind of a deeper, darker world, but our sound was sort of lighter and more enjoyable. We became almost, for lack of a better word, a dark pop band that it was okay to like, you know, it was yeah. okay to like Uma and Pennies for Love, you know, and still be into all this really dark, dirty kind of stuff. And that was something I always was very, very proud of. I was proud of writing pop songs. I love that we did like Fame, Sleep, and Horse. Those are songs that to me are, those show, the those are the parameters of what we were capable of as far as like just broad-minded, broad-sounding, writing something that was more deeply emotional and connected on so many levels. But I think every every band, when you're capable of writing something that deep and that dark, you've also got to have a lighter side to lessen that and to lessen that tension. Because if you're living in that world like we were, seeing friends drop from addiction, seeing things happen, you kind of have to have something lighter and more fun. You know, I remember an interview the Smashing Pumpkins did and Billy Corgan talked about how he made sure every night he was home to watch Jeopardy. I can completely relate to that. It's kind of like when you exist in a big, crazy rock and roll world with crazy rock and roll stuff, you crave something that's kind of simple and kind of bright and kind of like not so deep, dark and dirty. And I think one of the things Majesty Crush did was we were able to play with and complement much harder, darker, rocking your bands, but we were able to do it in a way where we weren't competing. We were like a flip side of it. It's like we, we opened for Curve when Curve did their biggest tour ever. It was one of our best shows because we went up and did what we did, which was, you know, kind of groovy. Dave as a front man, whatever. And then Curve did what was essentially kind of like a European female led version on a much different path. But you could see the connection between the band. And I think that's one thing we did really, really well is we wrote a gamut of songs and we had a style that a lot of people in other bands could respect and admire. Because frankly, we didn't sound like them and we weren't trying to compete with them. We were trying to compliment them. And I yeah. think that's something we just had. We were just kind of, I mean, there were times I was like, is this too mellow? Like is playing Fain Sleep as your first song? Is that a good idea? You know, this thing's about sleeping. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that's the kind of thing. We were very fragile almost. And I think that fragility gave us, we kind of occupied our own little cozy space playing with these bigger, badder bands, you know? And I'll always be super proud of that. I think the scale of Majesty Crush was very immediate and simple. That's what made Dave so great. He connected with everybody who came to see him. And that's something I think we owe to the fact that, um, and it's ironic too, because again, we're very limited on the live footage, but Dave was bar none. He's, it was incredible front man, like just stalking the stage. You could see the look in his eyes, you know, he would do pennies for love, but then he, you know, we had harder songs, we had darker songs and he could just flip the light switch and go into that character, that person. 
And that's, I think, what was so incredible. And that's part of the thing, too. One of the things about shoegaze and where it kind of transitioned, I remember Michael introducing us to this idea that, like, there's these bands that are kind of shoegazy, but they have a dedicated singer. Mm -hmm. And we were like, what? And they're like, yeah, there's one called Verve. And then there's one coming out pretty soon called Oasis. And we were like, get the heck out of here. But that's kind of where more we identified with was the personality driven bands like that, you know, with a dedicated front man. And we were lucky because Dave, just for who he was, everybody liked him. Everybody was like, he's a great singer. He occupies his own space in the world very clearly (laughs) Um, for better or for worse. But I think that's what was so beautiful. I mean, I remember Hope Zandoval. I mean, the sounds was the biggest name drop in the world. But Hope Zandoval comes up to us after we play our very first show and goes to Dave. Hey, I really like your voice. Which she's going to say to the opening band. But for our first gig, you know, we'd only been a band for maybe five or I think less than a year. It's well, kind of a big deal. Yeah, that that was great. Legend, you know, I can't yeah. imagine. You know, because I know Hope. She's very with kind of restrained in live performances like she's very low-key so i'm just trying to imagine yeah. dave going on at first and just capturing the audience almost like it sounds like he almost adjusts his vibe based on the song like he's like in it very much so and yeah. dave was beautiful at that i would say that's his the thing that i will give dave credit for over and over and over and over again is he let us play the music and we let him write the words and sing mm-hmm. and he enjoyed and this is, again, a connection you will never make. We were massive Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds fans. Massive. And we loved that Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds had this, you know, kind of interesting instrumentation, you know? We always joked they sounded like a garage band from like 1870. Um, <laughs> yeah, but Nick Cave that. was out in front of it. The band was back here doing what they did, and he was out in front of it. And he loved that. Like I remember a cave record would come out. He would, he would sing along to it. You know, when I first came to town, I mean, he loved Nick cave. He loved the bigness of Nick cave. He loved the, the, um, the deep narrative, you know? And that's something I think Dave, Dave owned as a singer. He was able to tell stories and create worlds. that felt like a dream. And to be honest, if you were living in Detroit in the early 90s, it was a weird and empty place. You felt like what you were doing was happening in a dream. It was silent. You were connecting more based on quality than quantity. You know, you'd go to shows, very few people were, I mean, alternative radio was starting to happen, but you almost had to feel like you were in a town where nothing was going on to be able to incubate what you were doing. And I definitely think Dave was a great product of that. He tried to create his own world visually, lyrically, thematically. And it was so original and it was so charming. You know, it's like in Boyfriend, I'm going to walk, I'm going to talk, I'm going to jig till you smile. That's very, that's Dave in a nutshell. Total people pleaser, even if he challenged you. Something he did beautifully and wonderfully. Yeah, you know, and... uh it's a testament to your versatility that you guys, um, you know, you pull in all these influences and really sets you apart. It creates music that's timeless, I think. Um, to hear you have songs that are, you know, they're pop songs, but they're also very hazy and, you know, it's very developed in a way for a lack of a better term. So I just, I think. Well, it's funny you say that because, you know, one of the things I learned, (laughs) I never knew this, So we're writing the liner notes and I'm helping Fred do research. And um, Michael used three pedals. He used a tremolo pedal, a delay pedal, and a rat distortion pedal. That's it. And I listen now and I'm like, he got all that sound out of those three things. Like, this is insane. This is so good. And it's funny because, you know, one of the things Kevin Shields was quite proud of with a lot of early My Valley Valentine was he used to say, um, you know, he more relied on natural overdrive. He wasn't a big fan of a million pedals and the real fluttery sounds. He wanted to kind of take, he wanted to take the guitar sound and make it so overdriven it became something else. In other words, he worked with a small thing and he turned it into something very original as opposed to, 
and now, I mean, of course it's different, but you know, it wasn't about the quantity. It wasn't about the quantity of pedals. It was about the quality of pedals. And that's like something that. that I think was perfect is Michael, you know, I listened to the way he, his guitar, it's a three string guitar on Fane sleep, just how beautiful it is. Or like, you know, even on horse, just, I can't explain it, but it's kind of like, I always say the songs that I wrote were good, but the songs that Michael wrote were great. Like Celis, like, um, uh, he, he kind of wrote, he got, he wrote the riff and the break to, um, to Sunny Pie. Um, when Michael came up with something, it was, you were just in awe of it, you know? I remember um, Celis when he came up with those notes, it was so fragile. And the way we would just climb up and down this melodic kind of thing. And then we wrote this great thing at the end where Dave is turning the name of the French Open, Roland Garros, into a sing-along because it's, that's something only Dave can do with his tennis obsession. I yeah. remember just going, man, this is this is better than anything I could ever come up with. But boy, oh boy, am I grateful to be part of it. You know, I mean, that's a th the thing is one thing. Uh, the biggest revelation for me putting together all this stuff was the record we did after the record label goes away. It's our angry record. It's called Sans Muscles. How angry is it? I wound up quitting the band. That's why it's called Sans Muscles. But I recorded it. And my bass lines are like, bow, bow, bow. they're not these big melodic things anymore. There are these punchy excuses to just be angry. Bow, 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 bow. They're not, they're not my Peter Hook ripoff things at all. Mm -hmm. And what's crazy is Odell's drumming is just insane. And Michael's guitar playing is like explosive. And what's funny about this, and this is where, again, I credit them. This was me writing bass lines from the perspective of being angry about getting dropped, about not wanting to go back down. You know, we were playing live gigs. We were upset with being dropped. So the energy was much more like, I mean, for this is a horrible comparison, but it's what I would think. It's what I would, it's what I thought in 1994, Rage Against the Machine, just something very, kept going insistent over and over again, almost like a hip hop loop. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and you listen to the playing and Odell's drums are like on, if JFA were still together, it's just, it's his drumming is like, it, it's an avalanche and Michael's guitar playing is phenomenal. And then Dave plays like a Leslie organ. So it almost has this soul angle to it, you know? But the fact that the band was capable of something like that, and I'm the least important part of it, you know what I mean? I'm like, there's a children's book called Stone Soup, and it's about a bunch of soldiers are living in a town, and they take over the town, and all the townspeople are distrustful of them. Mm -hmm. So they say, well, we're going to invite you guys out. We're going to cook you dinner. It's called Stone Soup. So they put a huge cauldron in the middle of the middle of the town square and they put stones in it and they start to boil the water and they say you guys can come out anytime we're, we're making you dinner it's called stone soup and they go oh cool well you know i have some carrots why don't i bring carrots and give you the soldiers some of these carrots so you can see what happens they trick all the townspeople to contribute all the ingredients for this soup yeah my yeah. base playing on sans muscles is stone soup i'm this thump and the rest of the band Again, the spices, they brought everything out. And that, again, is something at the time, I never would have thought about that. I never, but then writing the story of the band, it was like, yeah, we were angry. We wrote angry music. The song, If JFA so, Was Still sure. Together, well, there's a song, the song is If JFA Was Still Together. It could have been called If Majesty Crush Was Going to Still Go On. You know, yeah. it's very... At the time, it was like, gee, Dave, what a neat, interesting idea. You know, you yeah. wrote number one fan about Jodie Foster, and now you're writing a song about a band called Jodie Foster's Army. <laughs> and now I look back on it, and it was like genius, you know? Yeah. But that's what's funny. It's like at the time, I just, we were so, I mean, I was so dumb. I just wasn't like, wow, this is really great. This is really special. It was like, yep, we did it again. 
what's next? You know, we got a little frustrated here. And I think that's one of the beautiful things. We weren't overthinking it back then. We were just doing it. I mean, it was very naive to put out a record like Sunny Pie. You yeah. know, I could run that by 100 musicians who would say, this sounds terrible. It's underdeveloped or whatever. But that's what I said. It was like, part of us was like, wow, there were songs A.R. Kane was making, Jesus and Mary Chain were making. They were so simple. They were so good. They existed in that little seven inch world, that little, that little tiny little space of goodness and preciousness that you could just embrace it and listen to it. And the fact that we were capable of that, you know, one little tiny baby step of being a band, that was like the biggest deal. You know what I mean? And it's hilarious it started, because yeah. I look back on it now and it's like, it'd be hard to make a song that mellow and that kind of ethereal, you know? <laughs> and, yeah. and yet that was like our best foot forward. We were like, this is our sound. Yeah. Hilarious, you know? It's almost better not to overthink it too, though, you know? Like you just got to put it out there, I would think. Yeah, I mean, I can't describe how naive it was. Dave gets out of jail and I have a bass line for Pennies for Love, and it's three notes. And that turns into a song. I mean, it's like if you if you ask me like what, what, how it doesn't there's it doesn't make sense. And it just happened. And I think that was the thing. The thing again, Dave did this a lot. We'd record, he would record everything on like a uh it was a cassette player. It wasn't like a boom box. It was a cassette player that was for like dictating into. And he would always, he would record everything. And then we'd go back and he'd write lyrics. And then one or two practices later, he'd, he'd start doing the lyrics. And we were like, oh my God, like, I can't believe it. You know what I mean? It's like we started the framework and then he went ahead and like decorated it and, you know, completely went nuts on it. And it was always like completely impressive and bizarre. And I don't even think I appreciated it at the time. I was just like, yep, Dave's a great singer. You know, he's a total character. But now looking back, I realize how few bands in our milieu had that quality. No, like, I can't think of any other, you know. <laughs> I mean, even, you know, I, we love the verb. The verb were to us like proof. They were, they were a proof of concept that what we were doing could find an audience. We were different. We were definitely, I think we had a little more in different things going on than them. They definitely were coming from more of that psychedelic kind of Pink Floyd, super groovy. It was maybe a little bit more predictable, but it wasn't any less great. You know, yeah. to me, they were like if the Stone Roses and Pink Floyd kind of somehow became the same band. And oh, yeah. what we were doing kind of needed a little bit more self-consciousness and Dave kind of writing more like stories and whatever, because that's the world Dave existed in. You know, he was a guy who had a way of navigating the world with his own language and his own thoughts to the point where it must have been a tremendous burden, but also a tremendous joy. Like he had his own language of just dealing yeah. with people and he was able to turn that into lyrics. He was able to turn that into his performance. And that's part of the, that's part of the thing that I think the Majesty Crush story, it's so bizarre, is we had one of the most unique, if not one of the most talented singer, lyricist, frontman of the era. And yet he was a total anomaly. You know what I mean? He's a black German. He's in a, by default, the shoegaze band from Detroit. Mm -hmm. And yet he, I mean, the story goes, you know, Einster's into Neubotten. You know, Einster's into Neubotten, right? German guys, Blixa Bargeld, he was in the Bad Seeds. Look it up. It's pretty impressive. They are called, Einster's into Neubotten is called Collapsing New Buildings. It's the most German band in the history of German bands. Yeah. Dave is German. He grew up in Germany. He grew up between Germany and the United States. His dad met his mom in Germany. Hmm. And we go to see Neubauten just because it's something to do on a Wednesday night and they're an important band. Dave is up in the green room of St. Andrew's Hall just talking to the singer Blixa Bargeld in fluent German. 
you know, like, <laughs> how are things back in the homeland? Blah, 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 blah. And you're just like, this dude is on like a Bowie level of cool. You know what I mean? yeah. <laughs> he's like, he's like talking to the singer of one of the craziest bands of all time in fluid German. And that was Dave, man. I mean, you've seen the pictures. He'd dress up like a soccer goalie. He would yeah. wear a wetsuit. <laughs> He'd wear a wetsuit with Majesty Crush Detroit on it. Why did it say Majesty Crush Detroit? Because when Pink Floyd played live at Pompeii, all their amps said Pink Floyd London. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, that's funny. I know, right? You're just like, yeah. dude, man. Yeah, I know. It's it's interesting. You just, you look into the lyrics, it's almost like you peel it layer by layer. You're like, oh crap, there's actually a story here, you know? Each of these songs, oh, yeah. even brands, you know, like her brand brand is one of those songs. I that's that's like, I mean, it's a step away from album filler. I don't think it's our finest moment, but yeah. it's a great example of Dave stepping out of the crazy narrative and just writing something that is painfully true. And the yeah. thing I love about that song is it's not pretty. It's not. Um, it, it's it's kind of a song I don't even know how to put it but it almost reminds me it's a really straightforward song it's on that descending it just keeps descending and it's just Dave falling down over and over again and in a weird way it was kind of like a wellness check you know as yeah. songs go it wasn't our most ambitious in any way shape or form but I think it was cool because it's the one song where Dave is just Dave. He's not a character. He's not telling a big, voluted story. He's not being crazy, obsessive guy. He's just being Dave. And even when he's doing that, he sounds like a character. And I think that is kind of the blessing and the curse in a weird way. But that's kind of how it goes. Yeah. He just has a natural charisma to him. You know, I... uh I listened to some of the old interviews you guys did and he's just, he comes across very likable, talkative, just a natural humor. So I can see how that manifests in his songwriting as well. We lived, when we lived together in Ann Arbor, we were living actually with the, um, I lived with a guitar player from Spawn Ranch. We lived in a huge house in Ann Arbor, University of Michigan. You'd get these houses that would have like 10 bedrooms, right? Yeah. So I'm in one. Brad from Spawn Rants is another one. Dave's subletting one. He turned me on to Sid Barrett's solo work. Oh. I had never been familiar with it. I knew Pink Floyd like everybody else did. But he turned me on to, I still can see the cassette, him writing Saucer Full of Secrets in his thing. And I mean, he had a working knowledge of Sid Barrett that was just fantastic. And as you know, Sid Barrett also was blessed and cursed with having the ability to create his own language his own imagery, but it became so much of his own world. It was as much a curse as a blessing. He became unable to exist outside of it. It became the act became the being. And it's so weird because now looking back on it, I mean, obviously Dave had way too much in common with Sid Barrett and you, I don't know if you guys are big Pink Floyd fans, but you know, the Pink yeah. Floyd that you know is the Pink Floyd after Sid Barrett basically goes insane and is gently nudged out of the band. The song Wish You Were Here is about the band wishing that Sid hadn't gone insane. I don't yeah. know if you know that. I'm not trying to talk down to anybody, but you yeah. know, you can see a lot of Dave in that. You can see a lot of Dave in that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I can hear that. Uh yeah, I, I listened to one of Sid Barrett's solo releases. I think it was his first solo release. And you hear songs like No Good Trying and uh and uh, I think it's called Love You. It's been a while since I've yeah. heard it, but you do hear this these very strange instrumentals that he's doing and these lyrics that are just like, you know, what is he saying here? He's almost like, it has like a double meaning, I think, or yeah, it's it's very strange. And I can, I can yeah, see that. Yeah, and I mean, it's now I'm almost getting chills because it's kind of like all the evidence is there that Sid is losing it. And there's a lot, you know, when I listen to some of Dave's lyrics and whatever, I hear how the weight of things kind of bared down on him. I mean, one thing I cannot underestimate is that we all were pleasantly surprised that Majesty Crush did well. Dave, he he bought a house with his parents to dedicate 
to being in a band. He, his parents helped finance all our independent releases, pressing up the records, pressing up the CDs. Um, this was what Dave was doing for his life. And the thing that you cannot underestimate is that it was a long struggle. You know, his parents, they were kind of like a biracial version of the Huxtables, you know, in Southfield. They were like successful. Um, you know, Odell remembers Dave was like kind of really cool because he had this European vibe to him. He was almost like preppy, but kind of new wave and in, in that way. Yeah. But, um, you know, Dave in many ways... And it, as it turned out with P.S. I Love You, he was going to do music no matter what. You know what I mean? He was just going to keep going and going and going. And that's where I see the weight of Majesty Crush just got really weird when we do Sans Muscles. I leave the band because it's just becoming dysfunctional. Um, Dave picks up the guitar and that winds up being what winds up starting P.S. I Love You. And P.S. I Love You is very different from Majesty Crush. The irony is I wind up reconciling with Dave. I wind up drumming and playing bass on the first PS I Love You record, Heart of Stone, which is, again, total irony, but there you go. Um, but, um, you know, I think we all had other careers too. I was a writer. Um, Odell, Odell actually was a host of a children's show out of Detroit on public television called Club Connect. You can see it on Google. He'll hate me or on YouTube. He'll hate me for saying it, but it's hilarious. He was hosting a children's show. I didn't know that. Um, called Club Connect. Look it up. It's fantastic. Um, and Michael, of course, was not only working at the record store, he was becoming an accomplished graphic artist and artist. Dave was a musician. That's what Dave had. Dave had songs. Dave had relationships with people in the music business. That's what he did, you know? So I think when the label didn't work out and when I left, um, he just, he, he kind of buckled under it. And then with PS, I love you. It was kind of a way it didn't, it, the irony wasn't lost on me that he named the band PS like postscript after PS. I still love you. Not me, but I mean, just in terms of, I still love being in a band. I still love doing this. This is yeah. post Majesty Crush. Like it's P.S. I love you. Bad. Never, ever. I was in P.S. I love you. And we never talked about covering a Majesty Crush song ever, really? which should tell you where it played a role in our personal history. We were like, that's the past, you know? Yeah. It was kind of yeah. heavy. Yeah. It just sounds but, like it just kind of left a bad taste in your mouth almost where you're just like, all right, that was, well, them. we went from, I mean, this is, this is the world we're in. Right. So we play with the band in Chicago named Catherine. The drummer for Catherine is married to Darcy from the smashing pumpkins. Yeah. So we're friends of friends of the smashing pumpkins who are the biggest band in the world at this point. First time we drive to New York, you couldn't have scripted it any better. We're driving down St. Mark's Place, 8th Street, to go to the Bowery, which is where CBGB's is. But it just so turns out my childhood friend, Don LaFond, lives in a loft across the street from CBGB's where we will be staying. Like, if Damn. you were making a movie, you couldn't go. Let those Nobody will believe that. We're <laughs> driving down St. Mark's Place. And a blonde lady runs across the street and we have to hit the brakes. It's Darcy from the pumpkins. And we were like, what world are we suddenly in? Yeah. You know? And I don't know if you've heard this story, but when we're mastering the record, we master it at the smart studios in Wisconsin, which is Butch Vig's studio. Butch Vig, of course, Nirvana, Bush, and a little band called the Smashing Pumpkins. Yeah, so yeah. his drum tech, Doug Olson, is mastering our record. So we have our master tapes, and every morning we go in, and he puts them up. And it's it what it what a mastering is is it takes something that sounds great in the studio and makes it sound good on like record players and car radios and things like that. It's a very vital process. It's not particularly creative. It's more technical. And Dave and I are getting pretty used to this. We get up, we go. We watch Doug work. He goes, you hear that? We're like, yeah, whether we heard it or not. So one of these days, it's about 10 in the morning, and Butch Vig 
comes in and goes, hi, I'm Butch. And we're like, hi, uh, we're the band using, he goes, this is your time, right? You guys have got this. And we can tell there's something going on, man. He's got a look in his eye. And we're like, yeah. And he's, of course, his his drum tech is our mastering engineer, Mr. Colson, Doug Olson. Yeah. He goes, hey, do you guys mind if you take a break? Do you mind if I, I listen to this dat tape? I just got off a plane from L.A. and I just really want to hear it. It's a band I've been working with. And we're like, yeah, cool. What is it? He's like, oh, it's a Smashing Pumpkin, Siamese Dream. And we're like, how do you like your eggs, Butch? Like, we're going to cook you <laughs> breakfast. Of course, we want to hear the new Smashing Pumpkins. Yeah, yeah. And the story goes, and this is totally real. So he puts the thing in and he's going through track by track and we're listening and we're just like, this is, this is incredible. Like, and then it gets to that, you know, disarm song. I used to be a little boy and all that stuff. And I've told this story before, but this is so worth telling because it just shows you the world we occupied, how bizarre it was. Dave talking German to the singer of Einstein Zenda Neubaden, like insane. Yeah. Butch Vig is suddenly having a crisis of confidence. He keeps kind of souring his face and looking. And at one point, he actually turns to us. I think he's talking to Doug Olson, but we think he's talking to us. He goes, does this sound sound okay? Does this, ah, man, ah. And you can tell he's frustrated. And he starts to talk about getting back on the plane and going to L.A. to redo parts of this record. And we're kind of looking at each other going, and then looking at him going, no, no, Butch, it sounds great. It sounds great, man. I think this is fantastic. I mean, we're huge Pumpkins fans. We know, we know, Catherine, we know. Yeah, great band. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. And Dave and I are looking at each other going, what world are we in that we're talking Butch Vig off the ledge while we're mastering our little record, you know? And we're just like, it was the moments like that I remember Dave, the first time he saw the Verve, they were playing all these crazy kind of underground shows. They played after hours in an upstairs restaurant. And he stayed out till like three to see him. We're all up late anyway. He comes back to our friend Don LaVon's place. He's completely buzzed. He'd been drinking cooking sherry with Richard Ashcroft in the kitchen before the show. And (laughs) he was the first of us to see the Verve live. They were just called Verve then. And, and I can, I can see this, like it happened, it's happening right now. I go, we're like, how was it? And he just looks at us. He goes, Rod Stewart meets God, just <laughs> like that. And yeah. we're like, say no more, David, say no more. And that's what was so funny about these times we spent is we got to see, we got to be present for these really interesting moments in like, like not rock history or whatever, but I can't explain to you how nuts it was being in a band at that time where there was all this energy, all these different artists, some were getting huge, most weren't, but it put you in this world that you were a part of just by plugging in your amplifier. And it's kind of like, we'll never forget the night Nirvana did unplugged because it's a night we played to nobody. And we found out our label folded. Like the first time we go to New York, we see Darcy from the Pumpkins. We're like, Mike, who who would have thunk, right? And, you know, Dave strikes up what winds up being a, not a friendship, but he winds up, you know, a mutual admiration society with Richard Ascroft and the Verve. It's just kind of like, I can't, I look back on that now and it's like, it was the dream that we had when we were 27. It was just like, it, it was crazy that it even existed and I I look back on it now and I'm just kind of like like I tell you these stories and they sound like too impossible but they happened and I think they happened just because we were part of this world and in a weird way we were contributing to it in our very minor way and the funny thing is we thought we were witnessing all these other people's stories and now we're like a story you know what I mean like This little band from Detroit that never got a shot. And then the singer passes tragically after a a long period of mental decline. And it turns into like, oh, my God, we're the story now. You know what I mean? Because before we were just like, we got, we had like front row seats to everything cool. We got to see Ride and Lush. We got to see Nazi Star. We got to see Curve. We got to see the Valentines. You know, we got to see every, you know, 
we were part of that world, man. We were hanging out with them. You know, if you've heard the song, where the F is Kevin Shields, it talks about our photographer and best friend, Michael Cooper, actually living right where I lived in downtown Detroit, inviting my bloody Valentine to a party and Dave's hanging out with them all night. That really happened. Jeez. It's crazy. It's crazy, it's crazy how crazy. the music world just brings people together like that, where you think, all right, you know, my bloody Valentine's off in Ireland. You guys are in Detroit, you know, and then it's just like, but you're all are just so connected in a way. And that's just. Well, it's that's also, crazy. you know, something I'll say this and I'm not trying to be contrarian, but like, you know, I grew up with the doors in Van Halen because mm -hmm. there wasn't this mm -hmm. other music. Now, this same radio stations would play David Bowie and they would play Joe Jackson and they would play more new wave sounding bands like 999, which you've never heard of, but they had a song called Homicide. That's great. Clash were getting played on FM rock radio in Detroit. And I say this because even in this conventional rock world, and this was something that was kind of beautiful about it was we had like, you know, we felt like this was what rock was now. It wasn't just obscure. This was now big. And the reason I mention is, like I said, the Verve had toured with the Black Crows, which were like a total FM rock band. And yeah. few people know this, but do you know the My Bloody Valentine toured a lot with Dinosaur Jr.? And you're kind of like, what? Because Dinosaur Jr., we think of as being much more rock, certainly alternative rock, but yeah. more rock. But when you think about it, you hear it, right? You're like, wow, crazy guitar guys. This makes total sense. And they were like thick as thieves. The story oh, yeah. goes, Kevin buys his first real um, Jaguar because um, – uh, what's his name from uh, Dinosaur Jr. actually uh, like finds one for him and actually might have helped finance it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's the thing. Like we love bands like Spaceman 3 and then we love Spiritualized and then Dave writes up writing a, winds up writing a whole record called Dear Kate that's about the girlfriend of Jason in Spiritualized winds up leaving him to go and be with Richard Ashcroft. Dave is a witness to this. He sees this happening in real time. He's communicating on the message boards in the early 2000s. It's crazy, right? Late 90s, early 2000s. But that's what I'm trying to say is it's like, you know, Dave was so larger than life. And the band was our ticket into that world of all these personalities and stories. And I think the thing we never, we can't, couldn't realize till now is that we were actually a story as well. You know, yeah. and it's it, it makes me look, listen to the music totally like brand. I totally get it now. That was Dave's check in song. That was Dave's status report. You know. Yeah. What is that like uh, being having all these people like reevaluate you guys as like this band who, you know, releases this one album and then just several weeks later, our, you know, their label goes out of business. You know, what's that like just being revisited? Honestly, it's perfect. And I'll tell you why it's perfect. Because it creates something that now, like, I look at it this way. We're really digestible. You know, our entire body of work is going to be contained on two 12-inch records, four sides of music. Mm -hmm. Our story is very cohesive and complete. It will be told in the liner notes. It'll be told through things like this. Mm -hmm. And you appreciate the music as you discover it and enjoy it. And what I look at it is like this, is it's like, at the time, it's like I said, we never, we didn't chronicle this stuff. We didn't archive it. We didn't have a photographer, a videographer. We, we weren't even recording our best gigs. It was crazy. The best film of our gigs is after the record goes out of business, after the label goes out of business, we play down in Ohio. And we had this following in the Toledo area of these kids that were multiracial. They wore big baggy jeans. They drank 40s. And they thought we were like psychedelic. And they were in a band called Zebek. 
And now they're in a band called Dark Red in Detroit. Rob Smith is like a huge Detroit legend now. But back then, he was, you know, we had Zebek open up for us. And we played this, this guy's dad owned like a warehouse where like the Goodwill would store like old clothes before they went to thrift stores. But there was like a stage and we played like our best show ever there. And there's footage from it. Odell has the video of it. It's very grainy and the sound is amazing. But it, but like kids are jumping up and down during number one fan. It's not a shoegaze band. It's yeah. shoegaze music, but the energy is totally different. And that's the yeah. only thing we have that shows what we were capable of at the absolute height of our powers, which was the labels dropped us. We're on our own. We've got to do this ourselves. We're playing in a warehouse in front of a bunch of secondhand clothing <laughs> in Toledo. <laughs> yeah. And it's the best show we've ever done. And that's the way things played out. It was so weird. And that's yeah. the thing. I mean, it's like, I think if we would have just kept going on and tried to make record after record, um, you know, Dave had P.S. I Love You, which had its, it was totally great. It, I, the thing I credit Dave a thousand percent with, he never looked back. He yeah. just kept moving forward. He never tried to relive it or regurgitate it. He let it be what it was. And he was always in the moment with what he did. He could still write about um, Anna, who was it, Anna Kornikovia or whatever, the tennis player. He was still obsessed with tennis people, but he could write something different. He writes a song like I Bleed Gasoline. He created something that maybe, you know, it's something that I don't under, I didn't understand till now, but I have so much more respect for artists like Warren DeFever, right? From His Name is Alive. He's got this incredible band now called Infinite River. And it's so great. It's with Gretchen Davidson. And Joey Mazzola from the band Sponge. Now, in 1994, on my bingo card for 30 years from now, I would not have had one of the guys from Sponge will be in a band with one of the guys from His Name is Alive. But there you are. And I think there's so much dignity into moving forward and doing what you want to do and knowing maybe it's not going to be as big as what you did before, but also there's no reason for it to be. And I really credit Dave with moving forward in his own way, even, even as the wheels fell off mentally, physically. But I love that it was something that was allowed to stay good. It was allowed to stay what it was. And that the story makes the music a lot more special. And, you know, we haven't talked about the Dave's passing, of course, was not only tragic. It seems it took like a long time. You know, it didn't happen until 2017. And this is after years and years of mental decline and it's tragic and it's horrible, but it kind of puts who Dave was creating his own language, finding his own way. The Sid Barrett dichotomy of being in your own world, but also being trapped in your own world. Yeah. It brings it into such a different perspective where you just really appreciate it more. And I think that's the deepest word I can say about any of what we've been doing, like putting these records together and revisiting the history and talking to you, is I appreciate it so much more now. At the time, I took everything for granted. We were awed by it. We had funny stories, mm -hmm. but it was kind of like, you know, to be honest, we hit our first major obstacle and we basically let it fall apart very naturally. I give us credit that we did another record afterwards. I give Dave Odell and Michael credit that they continued without me, mm -hmm. but I also give us all credit for letting it gently, gently break up and be where it was in history, you know, because I can't imagine trying to, I'm a much better bass player now. <laughs> I'm a much better drummer now. And I, there's no way in hell I'd write anything as good as anything I wrote in Majesty Crush because I know too much about music now. Back then I was writing whatever I could play. I was yeah. like, wow, look at this. I can actually play this. You know, now I realize a lot of it technically is terrible, but it didn't matter. Sounds great though. Yeah. Oh yeah. But that's, that's <laughs> the thing too. We were also very lucky. We had these great studios, you know, we had Mikey Clark doing all our early stuff. He did music for Insane Clown Posse. He did music for Kid Rock. <laughs> he did music for George cool. Clinton. He did music for Primal Scream. That is the most. And he was just our guy. I've ever heard. He was just our guy. What? Yeah. 
I, I just say that's the most eclectic list of musicians I've ever heard. Like insane yeah. clown posse, George Clinton, yeah. Primal Scream. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> and he yeah. was our guy. That's we were awesome. in his, we were in his little side room at the studio that he worked at. Odell's playing his tape together drums, and that's how we recorded Sunny Pie. And then we get to work with Dave Feeney at the Temper Mill. That Dave Feeney, the guy who's the lap steel player on Jack White's Loretta Lynn record. This guy is, you know, he's the Temper Mill is an amazing studio. He's an amazing musician. That's the guy we record Sans Muscles with. That's the guy we record half of Love 15 with. And then the other half of Love 15 and the songs that you love so much, like Horse and Feign Sleep and Boyfriend, yeah. those are at the White Room studio, which is an even weirder story. So I'm from Gross Point. There's these two brothers from Gross Point. They play in a band called Second Self. It's kind of a funkier version of In Excess. They get a huge deal. It doesn't work out, but they have money. Their uncle's a dentist and owns a building in downtown Detroit, right next to where Michael Cooper had the party with my buddy Valentine, right across the street from where I live in downtown Detroit. It's that much like a damn movie, right? It's that yeah. simple. It's that connected. That studio had the Doobie Brothers 24 channel board. Oh, yeah. It had these things called Neve compressors, which process sound and it's the sound of every great fm fm um record for like 40 years basically and they had telefunken mics which i know almost sounds like a joke but everything was based on having this perfect vintage studio now the irony is we're not the first people to record there kid rock was sweeping the floor so he could record what became his first record. Oh, yeah. um, the guy who wound up producing Greta Van Fleet, Al Sutton, had a side room where he recorded. That's who we did PS I Love with. But it just so happens these two guys that I knew from my hometown had a studio across the street from where I lived. And it just happened to have all these vintage, all this vintage studio gear. So we were able to go in there and record a record that wasn't limited by indie rock or shoegaze or being being something that was supposed to capture that one moment in time. And we kind of we we didn't quite understand at first, but their point was instead of making songs to fit a genre, how about you make these songs just as good as you can get them so they the sounds and the way it's put together has more is more akin to all the greatest rock music in history as opposed to what you think is cool yeah. and boy oh boy did, were they right michael and andrew nira like i give them utter and total credit that's um, good to hear because i was actually curious to hear uh how the record labels were because you know you think when the album comes out love 15 and 93 that's when that's like peak grunge era so i was wondering if yeah. there was any pressure from your label to adjust your sound at all no no not at all not at all in fact yeah. boyfriend was done as a demo well, that's good sorry boyfriend was done as a demo and that wound up being the um the the thing we demoed winds up being the lead single on the record and probably one of our best songs. The thing that was cool is the label, we were hesitant. Again, we were so small town minded. We wanted to have like work with a local studio, local producers. We wanted, we didn't want a lawyer from New York. We wound up going with a lawyer from Chicago. We wound up going with a manager from Detroit. We learned the hard way. There's a whole, remember how I said Ween was really connected? We weren't really connected. Yeah. We learned this the hard way, where we were blessed. And again, you can't script this. But that studio is called the White Room Studio. Those two brothers grew like their equipment. They would start to rent it out and find other vintage gear for other people. They built an entire studio for Lenny Kravitz. They are now called Vintage King. It is the world's biggest and most successful retailer of vintage and new audio equipment and their specialty is that vintage stuff so 
So we happen to record almost as a guinea pig through what turns out to be one of the best recording studios with some of the best gear ever made. What and blessing. we were able to write songs, but we were able to produce them in a way with Fane Sleep Horse that became what they became. And that's just kind of how it all worked out. You know, we were super lucky. But again, we couldn't at the time, we didn't know it. In fact, we had recorded with the Neras and we kind of felt the songs that worked really well in that studio were done. But we wanted to go back to the temper mill to write the more, to do the more straight ahead stuff. Mm -hmm. And so what you hear on the record is half temper mill, the bigger, broader stuff like horse, um, boyfriend and feign sleep. And then the punchier stuff is done at the white room or at the uh, temper mill in Ferndale. And it just worked out like that. That's but again, how lucky were we to be at that place in time? You know? Yeah. Crazy, huh? That is absolutely crazy. Yeah. Just to be, yeah, just to be a group coming from the Midwest, you know, it's, uh, you know, Snail and I, we're both from, uh, we're both originally from Iowa, so it's great to get some uh, Midwest representation. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. Well, yeah. Tripmaster Monkey is from Quad Cities. You know where that is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's really cool. So, yeah, um, I'm curious to know, what are your thoughts on the term shoegaze? Shoegaze, like any other, uh, you know, people called Nirvana a grunge band, but I would say Nirvana was actually a really great uh, band that wrote very straightforward rock and roll pop songs. And you listen to a song like About a Girl, and that's not a grunge song. That's a Beatles song. It's that good. It's at that level. Yeah. I think shoegaze is a really good term to describe music that has a certain shimmer that it has a certain uh, opaqueness to it. It has a certain emotional resonance because it's a little more delicate. And when it is powerful, it kind of wants to be full on in kind of an ecstatic way as opposed to a riffy way. Yeah. I, I adore the term, but I also kind of feel like the best bands in any genre, it's kind of like the Bee Gees, we're a great band and then they did a disco record and then they kept writing great songs. I don't yeah. know if you've ever seen the MTV Unplugged for Saturday Night Fever, but the Bee Gees play all their disco songs with three-part harmonies on acoustic guitars and you think you're listening to the Beach Boys or the Beatles. In other words, great songs in a certain genre. Um, Rod Stewart, great musician, been in a thousand great bands, The Faces, blah, 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 blah. He writes, do you think I'm sexy in the disco era? He writes a great song in the style of disco. I kind of think like we came out of a time where in a, our technical skill, our guitar playing, our bass playing, our drumming, it fit with a certain genre at the time. But I think the best stuff we did was kind of a little, just doesn't fit in as easily, you know? I'd say Celis is the most shoegaze song we did. That and the song on Sans Muscles called Space Between Your Moles. Those are the most shoegaze. I also think Funny Pie is pretty shoegaze. Yeah. And I'll and I'm I, and I'm embracing that. I'm very, very proud of it. Again, that's Michael. It's Michael amazing to this day when I hear all that stuff. But I think you know, as far as what I listen to, I listen to stuff like Talk Talks, Laughing Stock. I listen to music that's more, um, it's got the spareness in it. It's got some of the darkness. It's got some of the whatever. But I always, I think sometimes there's too much information in shoegaze. There's too much overload. And it's not that I don't like it. I love that people are making this music. I love even more that you have a generation upon generation upon generation finding their voice through this. I yeah. think it's beautiful. But when I think of Majesty Crush, I think of a band that if you just play the instrumental tracks, you would say, yeah, I can hear the shoegaze thing. But with David singing, I think it becomes something else. And that's what I'm proud of. I'm proud of the fact that we were definitely part of a shoegaze movement but almost out of naivete and technical lack of ability we kind of transcended it at times 
And I think that's something that makes me respect the shoegaze world, but it also makes me, you know, it's why when my bloody Valentine put out MBV 10 years ago, it didn't sound like the same band anymore. In a weird way, I really respected that. It was much more percussive. It was much heavier. I totally respect and understand that. And that's the kind of thing. I think we were blessed to be there at a time when the best of the best of the best was happening. Ride, lush, touring together. You know, the ride, the, there's, it's no, the ride 1991, ride lush tour 1991 inspired a ton of bands. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like you look at you, I'm sure like the drop 19s, all these bands would say, yep, yeah, we saw that show and thought, yeah, we can move forward. We, we've got the right idea. Oh, you know? really? Yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. That's totally. cool. I didn't that's, know that's that. That's kind of like a Googleable fact at this point. Yeah. Well, that's I awesome. totally appreciate it. But that's, that's kind of the thing. It's like one of the beautiful things about having Michael be this kind of gatekeeper, right? At this record store is he's giving us loop. He's giving us Verve. He also gave us like Monster Magnet because they were just such a weird band. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it was kind of this almost like joke heavy band. Oh, really? um, yeah. And I, I mean, I mean, it's kind of like a in college, you know, Odell and I went to go see White Zombie when they first toured. And they're, they're, they, when they were first White Zombie, they sounded like the cramps meets the bad brains. They were super guttural. It was like watching... Uh, it was like watching uh, the birthday party if they were the, the the cast for the movie Quest for Fire. They were like these cavemen doing this weird shocky rocky. I've never heard of that. That's cool. I Just picturing that in my head, that sounds like quite a show. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. But uh, yeah, well, I think... You Give know, me a second. Oh, okay. I'm trying to get my air put up. No worries. Uh huh. Pop open a drink here. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm always interested to hear, you know, speaking to people who are around during the shoegaze movement, how, what they think of the term. Because, yeah, I know Mickey Berenyi of Lush. She hates the term. Um, well, the- yeah, I mean, and I think the reason is because you know grunge was a lazy term yeah but so what if that's how you get into it that's how you get into it you know i i I look at it like this any term that serves as a bridge to take an obscure kind of music to a larger audience i love Mm -hmm. i'm from detroit i was there at the dawn of techno i know what it was i know what it wasn't Some of the stuff that gets called techno today, of course, it's not techno. It's electronic dance music. It's it's much different. But I'm not going to be that old guy saying, get off my lawn with your cheesy new stuff. I'm going to embrace every second of it. Yeah. Because I think every generation has a right to find and love what they love and do it without any judgment unconditionally. And no matter how it works, if, you know, because there was a time when journalists would come up with, you know, the term shoegaze or whatever. That doesn't exist anymore because there's too much other stuff, social media. But I applaud all that. I love it. I think it's all really, really cool. And I I embrace that that there's this shoegaze movement still going on and there's new bands. I mean, personally, I love the band Cold God. They're on the Deus record, which is Deus label out here. And that's the label that Spawn Ranch, my old band, actually has a compilation on. Um, but what's so cool about that is they're mostly of color. They're from Southern California and they play a kind of heavier shoe gaze mm-hmm. where, you know, it's like they grew up listening to maybe like the Deftones, that big ringing, rot, nice anthemic, deep waves of sound. But they also really like My Bloody Valentine and they love the stuff that had more of a sparkle to it because emotionally it resonated with them. And I love that. I love that. And those are the kind of bands that I have so much respect for that are taking something that was it's 30 something years old and they're able to push it forward. You know, are they a shoegaze band? I'm sure there's arguments about it. I think they are. But what I love about it is they're not limited by it, you know? Yeah. 
I think that's something that I would say that one of the things I'm really cr- proud of Crush about is we didn't repeat ourselves a lot. No. You know, it was funny. It was like the Sands Muscles EP is very, very different from the record. It has much harder songs. The One Shoe Gaze song, Celis, or um, um, what do you call it? Space Between Your Moles is probably the most shoegaze thing we ever did. And it's followed by Sane and If JFA Were Still Together, which are the hardest, most rock songs we ever did. So I think the beauty of being playing music is you will naturally progress forward. You will naturally advance. That's why I love bands like Jesus and Mary Chain. I can listen to any Jesus and Mary Chain song, know it's them from the third note, and their ability to keep expanding what and how they do is just mind-boggling. Primal Scream, same story. These are bands that I love. I always say some bands are good without having to be great because they just are them, and you love that they're them, and you want to hear what they do, and you love it, and you respect it, you know? And it can't be replicated I mean, either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the yeah. thing. That's that's. I, I don't think you can ask for anything better in this world than to be able to say, go into a, the store of history and see on the shelf that there's something recognizable, enjoyable, you know exactly what it is, but you're also going to be thrilled by it. And I think that's what the best bands do. They embrace their audience, they embrace their sound, but they're able to gently nudge themselves and the audience along in a way that's thrilling you know i mean i don't know how much you know about the band talk talk but they did it's my life the song no doubt covered yep yep needed to do the two most dreary beautiful records ever recorded spirit of eden and laughing stock and they're completely different from what they ever did before and they're two of the best records ever made laughing stock is one of my favorite records of all time because it's so cool it's so weird and that's yeah. one of those records, like Radiohead was totally influenced by it. the group Uncle, DJ Shadow and James Lavelle from, um, um, what do you call it, that uh, trip hop label. They were totally influenced by Talk Talk, Laughing Stock. I love that. I love that, you know? You yeah. Know? I don't know if you remember, there was a Lollapalooza that Metallica played on, which right there, there was a Metallica that Metallica played, uh, there's a Lollapalooza Metallica played on. <laughs> what's his name <laughs> comes out the guitar player with the curly hair comes out oh, and he God. says i'm want you to introduce you to my favorite band ladies and gentlemen this is the cocteau twins and you can imagine you know and i love that i love that i think that's that's it's like this it's the cocteau twins loving the stooges yeah you know that's i think the greatest thing is when you can take all your influences and come up with something that's just different enough that it's yours in our case, it's because we technically weren't able to replicate whatever we loved and heard, but in the process, by default, we came up with something new. Well, yeah, and I think that's why there's still interest. Thirty years later, you have people coming wanting to hear your story, sounds you guys created, um, and yeah, and just with Dave as lead vocalist, it's there's really nothing quite like it, you know. Yeah, I, think- I mean, and that and that's and that's a story. I think as the records come out, and as more and more things happen. You know, things like this, I think the Dave story is going to become not only the story of the band, but it might just become the bigger story of this kind of music almost in general. And I don't mean shoegaze. I just mean like Dave's story, how Odell and I, Odell went to high school with him. I lived with him. We never thought about being a band. Then we wind up in a band. He does a random vocal for Odell and I's band because our singer can't make a recording session with Mikey Clark, the insane clown posse guy. And the next thing we know, we're in a band with him. And the next thing we know, we're making these records. The next thing we know, we get signed. We're in this world. Then we're not in this world. We keep going on and Dave keeps going on. And I think, you know, you asked about the shoe gaze issue. What I would say is that love it or hate it, this was Dave's band. It was Dave's voice. It was his lyrics. It was his world. And behind the scenes, it was his effort. And it was his, a lot of it was his. It was his band. And I think that's going to become more the story, you know, is the Dave's story. Like I can tell you a thousand great anecdotes, but 
who Dave was and how Dave is, and you hear this on the music, that's going to be, to me, the most important thing that comes out of all this re-release stuff is that Dave, I mean, this is, this, I'm not trying to, I don't want to get too emotional here, but, you know, in his things, mm -hmm. after he passed, his sister had to go pick everything up. Yeah, she lived she, in San Diego. She had to drive, or she lives in the Bay Area. She had to drive down. And one of the things she found was a note that basically said, hey, sis, if anything happens to me, just, you know, do what you can to make sure my music gets heard. You know? Yeah. And, you know, that was the story of how all this got going. Over the course of one weekend, Dave's sister is going to send a message to Third Man Records. We find out we have our master tapes. Uh, a friend of ours suggests we put the music back out because now, now's the time's right. And on Monday, we get an email from a guy representing, Rich Hansen, representing Third Man Records saying, hey, how'd you like to put Majesty Crush out on this compilation? So I don't know how many coincidences need to happen to know that this was supposed to happen. And maybe it's supposed to happen now with the stories and the revisiting it and everything. I kind of think like that's a part of it, you know? Yeah. And I can't help but think that because I look back on this and I'm as big a fan of it as anybody else. I hear it now. I don't hear me. I hear something that existed, you know? And that's kind of the most beautiful part of it is I can enjoy this now. During the time, there was too much other crap going on. It wasn't, I can't, it's hard to explain, but we, we didn't savor it because it always felt like it could go away or there was always something that was going to go wrong, you know? And our confidence got really throttled. And it's like you can we, listen to it now without judgment, it sounds like. Totally. Yeah. 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 And, and, and a big part of that, too, is that I think we were always, I mean, I know I was, I was very insecure because I thought a lot of our success was because Odell was very well known from Spawn Ranch. I was well known from being a writer. Michael was well known from being a record store clerk. And David was David. Dave was, David was out seven nights a week just being this lovable character, you know? And I think I always had a little insecurity that we didn't, you know, I knew, I knew in my heart we were a good band, but I also knew how many lucky breaks we got, no matter how hard we worked or didn't work, you know? And it was kind of like, that's what shot us forward, but it's also the thing that kind of, you know, it's the thing that kind of, in a weird way, when our luck ran out, it ran out, you know? Things just happened very naturally, and then they didn't happen very naturally. I don't know how else to describe it. Very Give me one second. Yeah. yeah. Give me one. Give me a second. I got to um, I gotta go in a few minutes, okay? Oh, okay. Yeah, no worries. No, it's uh, been uh, great speaking with you. Um, yeah. Well, I think if you just have a few minutes, should we just uh, snail? If you maybe just want to do one of these fan questions. Oh, do um, it. Sure. Yeah, yeah, we had a few fan questions for you. Oh, yeah, for sure. D throw them. Yeah, let's uh, do one real quick and then we can wrap wrap it up. Let me okay. see here. Um, okay. Um, I think this one's interesting. What w this comes from a Avilora seven one eight. What was <laughs> what was <laughs> Majesty Crush's musical influences, and how did those influences shape the band's style and sound? Also, why were so many of the lyrics themes around obsession in some way in lust? Two point. It's a great great question, and I can answer it super directly. Um, the influences were bands that we loved, but also that made music that we could relate to and felt like on a technical level, we could achieve if we really worked hard. Jesus and Mary Chain, A.R. Kane, um, like I even said, hip hop loops, simple things that had an A part and a B part. Um, the obsession part was just Dave. I think Dave grew up between Europe and suburban Detroit. So in his personality, a part of him was international and German, and a part of him was a black guy in Detroit. And I think with that comes 
a lot of, there's just a lot of life there. He's growing up with people that were part of Motown. He's writing all the time. He's an artist. He loves Sid Barrett. And I think a lot of the obsession of the lyrics, they kind of described how he was interested in things. He would become obsessed with things. It's what made him such a great artist. It was his obsession with expressing in creating this world. And it was definitely, if you met him for five minutes, you could hear it in his personality. He had a way of looking at the world where everything made sense, but it was kind of stylized. You know, he'd want to know what nationality you were because he could relate to you because of your European heritage. He would, um, he would reference musicians and stuff that you'd never expect him to, to reference because he expressed himself in that way. So that's a really good question. And I think it's, that's kind of it is we aspired to certain musicians we liked, but we also realized Dave was kind of a one of a kind and his personality, um, and his background, his ethnicity, I think definitely fueled all that obsession. Beautiful. Yeah. It sounds like What's another feel- one. Let's do one more. All right. Okay. Cool. Yeah, Let's sure. do another one. Yeah, let's do one more. <laughs> Someone just said woo. Marty Fiskett. <laughs> um, all right. Oh, yeah. Friend of the show. Um, okay. Would you like to have seen where Majesty Crush would grow and progress in style? And what would that sound like? So, like, if it continued... That's a great point. And I feel like the last, the last half hour, we talked about that a lot. I would say mm-hmm. really simply, um, Sans Muscles points that out, which is that we were still capable of the best shoegaze with space between your moles, but the more inspired writing was sane. And if JFA were still together, which was harder and more direct. And I think that had to do with us our own frustrations. And honestly, it wasn't that we were being shaped by the grunge or what was becoming big. It was just part of being a live band with just one guitarist and a singer. We had to use what we had to play a little harder. I would say as far as what we could have become and what we would have sounded like, those are, that's a fantastic question. I think we eventually would have gotten into programming And I think we would have done more with um, not synthesizers so much, but what we might have done is it would almost sound slightly remixed or it would have a a different technical angle on it. You know, I think that was kind of the direction we were going with some of the songwriting on Sans Muscles. Yeah. And cool. Nice. All right. Those are fantastic questions. Yeah. Well, um, I think just to conclude, uh, if people want to find you, do you want to like provide like maybe your Instagram or wherever? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm at Hobie Eklund, just my name, H-O-B-E-Y-E-C-H-L-I-N. And of course, our Minister of Information is <laughs> is Henry Boyer at MajestyCrushFan.com. Or, and, and no, no, he's just at MajestyCrushFan. But he's got a lot. He, he, in many ways, knows more than we do. He has more access to archival stuff. So he can point you to live shows and stuff like that. But um, those are the two best ways. And Odell is on Instagram. He's at Revisionist. And Michael is on it as Michael Siegel. Or no, he's the lookout. No, what is he? I think he is at Michael Siegel. Yeah. Um, his company's called The Lookout Group. But yeah, I mean, we're all really obvious where we are. All you got to do is look at any Manistee Crush fan post and we're all tagged in it. So those are all of us and we're all around. You know, we're going to be doing a lot more press. The records come out in March of 2024. We just got the test pressings. They sound amazing. One That's one really funny thing. We only ever heard the music on CD, you know, like in our cars and, you know, home. And to hear it on vinyl, like it's, it's a, it is, it's a, I'm not going to sound like an old man, but it is a different animal. It's just much more... Yeah. It's got more depth. It's more percolaty. They mastered it very much for vinyl. It's got a much punchier sound. That's all I can say. The extremes are a lot more extreme. And that's one thing that's kind of nice about it. 
Yeah, the parenthetical statement that is Majesty Crush is much wider in these remasters. I can't wait to hear it. That's going to be yeah. fantastic. Yeah, cool. Well, I well, can't uh, thank you enough for having me, man. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, I Thanks totally agree. Up. I mean, yeah, thank no, you so amen. much. Amen. Thank it's you been... for doing this. This is great. Oh, of course. Uh, it's it's definitely been our pleasure. So, uh, I mean, 90% of what we talked about, I'm like figuring out in real time. <laughs> yeah. You know, that whole idea of being there in the moment, not realizing, like, this is all stuff I'm getting in real time. That's the great thing about talking this, about this. Some of the stories you may have heard before, but the perspective is brand new, you know, because we learn more about this every day. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Then. Uh, all right. Nice. Well, well, have yeah. a great rest of well, your thank day. you for Thanks having for me, us. Nathaniel, yeah. and your brother with his unpronounceable name. But yeah, we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, I appreciate it, man. I'm signing yeah. off. All right. Yeah, you take Thanks, care. Guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Now, before we quit recording, I just want to make sure I shout out Henry Boyer. Uh, he has a beautiful documentary, uh, Majesty Crush documentary. You know, um, you know, I've made several documentaries. I've seen so many. And really watching his, I almost felt emotional as he was telling the story. So I will uh, link that video in, in the description for anybody who wants to watch it. And uh, I'll link his interview with uh, with uh, Hobie as well because, uh, yeah, he did a uh, fantastic job. So, uh, yeah, be sure to check that out. All right. Oh, I think that went well. We'll uh, see everybody. Uh, yeah, stay dreamy, everyone. Stay dreamy. <laughs>